Since we first looked up at the moon and stars, we must have asked questions about our place in the universe. So how did life begin on Earth? Is life common out there in the solar system and beyond? Are there other civilizations out there waiting to be discovered? And what would it be like to live on other planets? Well, in this video, we're going to meet the scientists who are using cutting edge research to try and answer those questions. So what was the Earth like about uh, 4.3 billion years ago? We know that there wasn't very much oxygen in the atmosphere near the surface. We know that there was enough of an atmosphere to sustain liquid water, but that there was also dry land. Beyond that, there's not an incredible amount that we know, whether it was hotter than today or colder than today, there are different scenarios for that. Whether the pressure of the atmosphere was 20 times what it is today, or it might have been a fraction of what it is today. A lot of these are still unknown, but they're being explored now. One of the wonderful things about working in origins of life research is that there's no generally accepted theory about origin of life. There are many different ways people are trying to explore the problem, some on surfaces of a planet, deep beneath the water, or even in space. The area that I explore most is the particular prebiotic synthesis that can take place driven by UV light on the surface of planets. Certain environments that are plausibly present on the early Earth, such as impact craters and the warm ponds that can actually fill these sort of crater basins, seem to be very, very promising places to do the sort of prebiotic chemistry. And it turns out hydrogen cyanide, hydrogen sulfide, and phosphates in the presence of UV light have opened up a pathway to forming the simple building blocks that are needed for life. This is the photochemical reactor, that is an instrument that we use on a daily basis that mimics the light coming from the young sun on the early Earth. And what we do with this is we prepare our solutions with simple molecules and then we expose them to UV light. In the liquid, hydrogen sulfide becomes dissociated, it becomes this anion, and the, uh, the UV light ends up knocking an electron off of that anion, which then goes to attach itself onto this hydrogen cyanide, which will react with the oxygen in the water and will also react with other hydrogen cyanides to build up a more complex chemistry. And the wonderful thing is that it's actually buffered by the phosphate, which then later makes the backbone for what eventually will become the RNA strands. Many people will have seen the iconic picture of the double helix discovered by Watson and Crick of DNA. DNA communicates with the rest of the cellular machinery with a molecule called, called RNA, which is a sort of close chemical cousin. A hypothesis about the origin of life that was actually proposed more than 40 years ago by Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel, among others, and that is that there was a primordial biology which lacked both DNA and proteins, but was based on RNA as the main player. A self-replicating RNA would begin to make copies of itself, would make those copies in a not entirely accurate way, so there would be mutations and there would be evolution. Like a snowball, kind of, this would get the whole process of self-replication rolling, and I think this is really the beginning of life. We can never be sure until we actually find an alternative form of life, for example, on another planet, if this is the only way. If you found life on Europa and you knew that that life originated a different way than it originated on Earth, or that this was a second origin, then that by itself, having those two data points, would already say that life is probably ubiquitous. It would seem quite extraordinary that in our particular solar system we happen to have two examples, and those are the only two examples within our galaxy. You know, it is a bit of a question about our place in the cosmos, you know, where have we come from? Is, is the cosmos literally teeming of life, or are we alone? If we were alone, I think it would be, we would have a terrible responsibility to not destroy you know, our habitat and our planet. Understanding more about our origins is important for contextualizing our future. The more that we actually can understand the scope in terms of time, and the amazing scope in terms of size on this very small planet, perhaps in a very small place, with very, very simple molecular machinery building into something this complex, can really help to contextualize and even to value how amazing life on Earth 
really is. And if we find out that life is rare through this sort of research, then that shows how much more we really need to value and preserve it into the future. The plasma rockets researched at the University of Surrey and their collaborators are a new method to propel satellites in space, pushing spacecraft to explore further into the solar system. But compared to traditional rockets, the force from a plasma rocket is tiny, the same force as a coin on your hand. So how can plasma rockets propel spacecraft so far? Why not use a traditional chemical rocket? A plasma rocket uses up its fuel very slowly, changing the gas fuel into blue plasma. But with the very fast speed of the plasma leaving the rocket, it is very efficient. A chemical rocket burns its fuel, using up fuel much faster, but the burnt products leaving the rocket are slower, meaning it is less efficient. So how do chemical and plasma rockets compare? Well, Imagine a race between a tortoise and a hare. The tortoise is slow, but keeps on going. The hare is fast, but gets tired. And we all know who wins. A chemical rocket is like the hare, whilst the plasma rocket is like the tortoise. The chemical rocket, with its greater force, accelerates faster but runs out of fuel. The spacecraft with a plasma rocket, burning less fuel but more efficiently, accelerates at a slower rate but keeps on going. So if you want to get somewhere nearby in a hurry, a chemical rocket is a good option. But if you want to go further, plasma rockets are the way forward. In a world reliant on mobile phones, communications such as the internet, and electronic monitoring systems, satellite technology is crucial to our modern way of life. Perhaps unsurprisingly, with ever more demand for services, more and more satellites have been popping up in orbit around the Earth. But this has led to a problem. There's now lots of junk in space. This space junk comes in all shapes and sizes, from the tiniest fleck of paint right through to dead satellites that no longer work. Even sections of old rockets are part of the Earth's space junk problem. Scientists have estimated that there's already an incredible 7,000 tonnes of junk in space, and it's increasing. The majority of useful satellites today were launched into low Earth orbit, which is anything up to around 2,000 kilometres above the Earth. Here, there is the greatest risk of collisions. Seen the film Gravity? Well, in reality, a huge pileup like that is unlikely. However, satellite collisions have occurred in space, such as the Iridium-33 collision in 2009. Scientists are now exploring the best ways to minimise and remove space junk in order to combat the problem. There are two methods. Ensure future satellites are able to get rid of themselves so they don't contribute to the population of junk, and to actively launch missions to rendezvous with and capture space junk. The Remove Debris mission will be the world's first mission to demonstrate capturing technologies that could deorbit space junk. The first experiment is net capture. A small CubeSat will be ejected, which acts as artificial junk. This will deploy an inflatable structure. The inflatable structure helps the CubeSat to deorbit quicker. Getting the net and the platform correctly aligned with the junk so the capture system doesn't miss is a big challenge. In a full mission, the net would have a tether line to pull the junk back down to Earth. The second experiment is harpoon capture. Here, a deployable target is used to demonstrate the use of a harpoon to capture space junk. The third experiment is a vision-based navigation and will also use an ejected CubeSat. Put simply, in order for satellites to rendezvous in space, camera and LiDAR technologies need improvement. LiDAR is a measurement technology that uses a laser to illuminate the CubeSat and read back information such as position and orientation. The final experiment is the drag sail. In order for satellites to dispose of themselves, 
future missions may have such drag sails attached. By deploying the drag sail using an inflatable boom, drag is applied to the satellite as it passes through the outer elements of the Earth's atmosphere. This added drag will return the satellite to Earth faster, where it will burn up in the atmosphere. Here we show the burn up of the main platform. The extreme temperatures during re-entry cause the platform to completely burn up. If we fail to clean up our space environment, more collisions are going to keep occurring, potentially making whole segments of space unusable, or damaging critical services that we use on a daily basis. The cleaning up of space junk is crucial to ensuring the sustainability of space for future generations to enjoy. I work on making universes. What we're trying to do is to recreate the universe and the galaxies and the stars of the universe in a supercomputer and that way we understand where they came from. I study galaxy formation because I think it's the um, ultimate question of you know, how, how did we come here, you know, how, how did everything form? Uh, and specifically, I'm very interested in the very first galaxies and the very first stars. So a simulation is uh, simply a way to solve the equations of physics in a computer, which uh, essentially to do a simulation, you program a computer with equations of physics, you let the computer solve them, and out comes a universe that um, if you've got the right Equations and the right ingredients looks a lot like the real universe. So that's what a simulation is about. Without the simulation, we can't really see how things change. Because when we take pictures of the universe, we just see one snapshot in time. And with the simulation, we can figure out how that might change. We deal with um, enormous sizes, enormous scales. We talk about billions and, and hundreds of billions and trillions. The universe is very big, but it's very simple. Compared to a human, was very small and very complicated. And that's why we know more about the universe than we know about individual humans. Well, it's one of the great human endeavors to understand where we come from. People always have wanted to know more about where they come from and what shapes the nature of the world around us. If for some reason humans suddenly stop doing science, we would very quickly go back to the dark ages, to the age of superstition, to the age of ignorance. I guess it's important because, well, first of all, it's really interesting. And second of all, it's where we've come from and everyone wants to know where we've come from, right? And why is it that, you know, we inhabit a universe like this and not a universe like something else? You know, we do music and art because we do music and art. We should do science because we do science. There's not so much an application as, I think, maybe an inspiration to a few people. I don't know why you wouldn't be interested in it. Like, <laughs> it's really, really cool. It's really, really important. Um, it tells us a lot about where we've come from and where we're going. In 2013, the European Space Agency launched a rocket from a launch site in French Guiana and traveled some 1.5 million kilometers to reach its destination in orbit around the sun. The spacecraft is called Gaia. Its mission is to make the largest, most precise three-dimensional map of the Milky Way ever attempted. The science behind Gaia was recognized by everybody right from the start as something that, that mankind must do. Uh, Gaia is going to be a revolution in fundamental astronomy. It's going to be a mission that's going to affect everything in astronomy. Gaia is going to produce tomorrow's version of all the great star catalogues that have gone back in history to the very dawn of astronomy. So it's our chance to understand how nature actually put together our night sky. The Milky Way, the galaxy in which planet Earth soars around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour, is so vast that it takes a beam of light 100,000 years to travel across it. It is home to more than 100 billion stars and maybe as many planets. It includes such exotic phenomena as star clusters, supernovae, 
gas clouds, supermassive black holes, and an elusive substance called dark matter. But it's not just those stars ablaze with nuclear fusion at their burning heart that we're interested in. Gaia is also looking for failed stars, brown dwarfs, stars that never truly ignited and are left adrift across space as interstellar itinerants. It will also provide an inventory of our solar system's asteroids and comets, from the near-Earth objects to those located in the furthest, frozen reaches of the outer solar system, revealing exoplanets as well as objects that could pose a threat to life here on Earth. On the 25th of April 2018, detailed information on more than a billion stars will be made freely available to anyone, anywhere in the world. This is the second major data release from Gaia, based on 22 months of observations and about half a trillion individual measurements. It will be the richest star catalogue to date, including high precision measurements of the positions, distance indicators and motions of 1.7 billion stars and will lead to a huge number of discoveries about our home galaxy. So what are the personal hopes and expectations for the Gaia mission? A mission 30 years in the making. We're going to be able to walk through the universe and we're going to realise just exactly what we are compared to other people. We're going to find tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of other planetary systems, some of which will be like our own, quite close. We'll be able to take pictures of those planets we're going to discover the things we can't see, the dark matter. We will go beyond what we can see to be able to understand reality. And I think this is exactly the same transition that Captain Cook made. We go beyond our preconceptions to see, hey, this is what the world is like, guys, and we'll be able to just walk through it. We will see the remnants, the debris streams, of the first shards that became what is today the Milky Way we can run the process right back to the first things that ever happened. We will see the entire history of the Milky Way unfolding before our eyes. We're going to discover completely new things. We're going to discover that stars are moving in ways that we think are impossible. And so we're going to learn completely new things about what happens. We're going to discover that there's actually an awful lot of matter there and hardly any there. And we'll be able to say, well, what is it then? How is that possible? So we'll learn a lot about elementary particle physics and possibly even about theories of gravity. So I think that's going to be the real dramatic change. The, the stuff that's going to, going to come out of Gaia is not the spectacular science that we know it's going to do. It's the stuff that we don't, the questions we don't know how to answer.